We do all kinds of things here at Word in Your Ear, quizzes, podcasts, video casts, author events, and we will not slacken in any way in our efforts to bring this stuff to you as Christmas approaches. And what we strongly suggest is you avail yourself uh, of a present for the person in your life that you love the most, i.e. you, and get yourself a Word Patreon subscription. And if you need further encouragement this year, there will be a Word in Your Attic annual, which will only be available exclusively to Patreon supporters. So have a look at the details at the link below. Word in Your Attic, a Zoom with a view. Well, you are indeed watching Word in Your Attic, and you catch us at a moment of great joy and celebration as we've been joined by someone who's just emailed to say that it's so cold in Scotland that is it okay if she stays in bed? The purely excellent Muriel Gray. And indeed, you are in bed, Muriel. Well, you, I, I took you literally, Mark. I mean, I did mean it's like there's a joke, and then you went, yeah, that would be great. I went, oh, this is fantastic. I don't have to get to bed. Well, why do you don't have to? It's lockdown, you know, there's it's, it's no reason to. I've been doing lots of Zoom um, meetings, obviously, but I usually do that Winnie the Pooh thing, you know, where you're only you're only you're only dressed to to the waist, basically. Um, so I, you know, I and I have done some from bed, but I with a jacket on, it looks as if I'm somewhere in a posh hotel. But you're still you're, wearing pajamas down yeah. below. Yeah, yeah. I'm full onesie in the dressing, you know, and so I'm really. <laughs> <laughs> So how are you? How, is, how have the lockdowns been? How have you been occupying yourself? Well, well, in Scotland, obviously, it's like um, it makes John Knox look like fun. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> we've got it about 10 million times worse than you because, uh, yeah, just because we're Scottish. So we've got to do everything Scottishy and different from you. So, so, so it's been really, really bad. But um, More suffering. More suffering. Yeah. But, as you know, to, to be Scottish is to suffer, and they're, they're, and thereby we must suffer more than the English, and that's all that matters apparently to, to <laughs> governments in particular. No, so, keeping... so where where do we find you, Muriel? <laughs> Apart from just in my bed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, where is the bed located? The bed is located in Glasgow, and. Right. Uh, and it's, it's, it's located in Glasgow. We're, we're not allowed to move more than 300 yards uh, at a time without having a bubble of 12 people, all of who are called Susan, except one with a hat on. <laughs> all right, uh, yeah, right. something like that. And where you went you? to the art college there, didn't you? Did you grow up in Glasgow? I did. But, oh, but, right. But, hang on, this is not all one way. Where are you? I mean, I mean, it looks like Mark's in some little bookshop, I mean, a record shop, and it looks like you're that, in a... Uh, yeah. I'm, a, I'm at home in North London, uh, right. in, in, literally in my attic. Okay. Which is why, yeah, well, kind of. Yeah, it's converted attic, but yeah, it's, it's attic. <laughs> I'm it? in my massively untidy uh, study in West London. Study. 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 <laughs> study. What a good word study is. Office. Uh, Office. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I am in my bedroom in Glasgow, and I do actually have an office, but um, it, it's not as warm as this. And so I'm, I'm going to enjoy this considerably more just you know, under a duvet. So. Right. But I, I, so, yes, I, I have, I've always lived in... No, I haven't always lived in Glasgow. That's a bare lie. I lived in Edinburgh for a while. That's so, yes. But, yes, I did go to Glasgow School of Arts, and I now find myself um, the chair of Glasgow School of Art. Oh, really? That's right, you are, that's right. Because it, And you must have had to preside over this, because my youngest son uh, lived up there for a while. And we went yeah. to see him in the, the art school, the great Macintosh building had burned down in 2014, and then they, at great right. cost, probably overseen by you, it was rebuilt, and then it burned down again. It was another yes. fire. Yeah, well done, me. Well done. Because <laughs> <laughs> last time I was not up in, there, I, I walked past it, and it had what, it appeared to me to be the world's biggest scaffolding around it. It was absolutely astonishing. Yes, well, it, well, it, well, it has to be, uh, it, obviously, uh, uh, Steve, otherwise it would fall down and kill people. So that's generally what scaffolding's for. And having got away with two fires, you know, not our fault, but luckily nobody was killed. We're not in the business of starting now. But um, I'm also on the on the board of the British Museum. You see how punk I am. Oh, I just, right, very yeah. Good. And it's uh, so it's having a lovely time too. So like anywhere, anyone that has me on their board automatically has an easy ride. Expected right. their... catastrophe. Yeah. So that, yeah. That, that's how you're spending most of your time on Zoom calls, dealing with all that stuff. 
Yes, I'm afraid so. That's why I, like, you know, I put, put a jacket on and try and look very governancy. Yeah, I don't yeah. Have to do that was you, chaps. No, no, you don't. We go back to to punk and things. We do, we do. <laughs> so, have you had to dig around and find any old, you know, first records ever bought or teenage singles well, or anything like that? What have you got? Yes, I have. I, the, the thing I was looking for, which I haven't got, which was the first album I bought, which was Slayed Alive, and it had a three gatefold. Oh wow! wow. Great record. Yeah. I know. A great record. So. Um, I think, oh, what have we got here? We've got, you see things, I've got all kinds of gorgeous signed things that you don't have because I've, I've worked at, on that program that was about music. Um, and the loveliest one I found was Pete Burns, The Dead, the Dead Alive. Which right. is, oh, is lovely. I know, because we had this really mad night out, him and Mark. Do you remember Margie Clark as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. the actress. Yeah, yeah, clubbing one night in Liverpool. And then I think I woke up in Preston a few days later or something. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but here's a, here's a really curious one. Look at this. This is, right, I don't even see it. This is, I'll try and get so it. Does it Bing Hitler Live. Do you recognise who that is? No, but I remember the name Bing Hitler. Uh, it's who, Craig Ferguson. It's oh, Craig, Craig Ferguson. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> Yes. And so it's Craig Ping Hitler live at the Tron signs to me. And um because I, we were big mates then before yeah. we and became very famous. And so that's a that's a bit of a collector's item. It you, is. Really stupid things. So that's, what era is this then? Was this around the time you were doing because you were in a you were in a punk band, weren't you? Is that right? I can tell you exactly because it says in the back it says recorded at the Tron Theatre Glasgow in nineteen eighty six. Oh, it's okay. Very... So, um, yeah, he and now here the interesting thing about yeah, this has nothing to do with music, obviously, but it's still an album, so it counts, does it? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah Go around do you like? Go on. Yeah, thank you. Well, he uh, he was in an act with um, with Peter Capaldi. Uh, yes. um, he was in a band called the Dream Boys, and when I was at art school. I put I am um, I, I was sort of responsible for the um, entertainment bit in the Victorian Cafe, and actually they were one of the first of the, the first few bands that we put on them. And Orange Juice, Orange Juice is the very first one. And sadly, I do not have an Edwin Collins thing to show you, but they were the first band that I booked. And and Peter was a singer in the Dream Boys, and uh, Craig Ferguson was the drummer. Were but, they any Were they any good? No, they were terrible. Really, Peter's very Peter's still recording. What I think Peter still makes music, he still does. Oh, well, the, I, think he, I think he's got some album coming out. I oh, think. no, no, Peter's great, he's a fantastic, yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, at that time, we were all in our 20s and we were all absolute arseholes. Oh, but I haven't checked. Is this that you're, you're allowed to say rude words? Yeah, 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 of course, you are, yeah, yeah, yeah. We encourage oh, it. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, Peter is amazing, and she's been playing uh, uh guitar with that. What's that? The, the, the lovely man from the Blow Monkeys, yeah, Dr. Uh, Robert, they're making an album. <laughs> I heard yeah. some of it, yeah. Great, it's absolutely great. Yeah, it is. It was really exciting. So, yes, I was at art school with Peter, obviously, so we in the same department. So, okay, so yes. was, there, was there any sign that Craig Ferguson would go on to be a kind of god of late night American television? Uh, yes. I mean, it's oh, not. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's no mistake. How did that show itself? Because he was one of the funniest people ever to be out with. I mean, but I should have a health warning on this because he has written about it hugely and talked about it himself. I mean, he was in the grip of terrible alcoholism yeah. at that point. Um, and, and he and I and, and a couple of other people used to hang around. But I had no idea. I just thought they were great fun to be with. I never notice when people are, are suffering from addiction. I just think they're hilarious. So... Um, he, uh, he 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 recovered and then went to America. But he was massively talented and really really ambitious. So yeah, of course, yes. Yeah, so yes, he's very talented. He has that ability. I, I, whenever I've seen him on television, to appear to be more relaxed on television than most people are in real life. <laughs> yeah, he, he's, yes, that, he, yeah, that can that can also be. That, that, that can be a handicap because I remember that ha that started to happen to me in a really bad way where the director said to me, you do, I mean, I'm, in fact, I'm demonstrating it now, actually, just by not even bothering to get dressed. So people said, please remember you're on television and people can see this. And so um, I think that's that. The difference is that Craig is very talented, whereas I'm, I'm just campy <laughs> <laughs> he is very talented, yes. Well, you're both very relaxed. What are your memories well, of the I'm tube? 
We, we, it was so funny because we were on Whistle Test when you were on the tube. And we were always terribly envious of your wonderful glowing reviews because we were thought of as the kind of boring elder brother, oh, you know, God. sort of playing his Wishbone Ash albums, you know, God. interminable long lead guitar solos. And you were so fabulously fashionable and, uh, you well, know. Well, well, well I wasn't. I was, I was brought in as the, as the kind of, you know, the, the kind of rough tree, the rubbish one. And it was, it was the glamour of Jules and Paula that made it fantastic. But I mean, do not do yourselves down. You know, I mean, nobody missed a whistle test. Are you kidding? It's about the most exciting thing. And the archive that you have is just absolutely ridiculous. I mean, but that must have been brilliant fun, was it? No, well, you couldn't, uh, in those days, you couldn't access the archive because kind of the past hadn't been invented in the same way that it has now. You know what I mean? It's only years after the whistle test stopped that the BBC suddenly turned around and go, hang on, have we got all this stuff? Oh, and then amazing. Jill Sinclair had to go round the world, pretty much finding guys who once played bass in Fog Hat. <laughs> yeah. Fine, because they'd only, people had only ever uh, agreed to one appearance and one repeat. I know. Something I know. like this. Whatever. They had to clear all the licenses. Because we, when we were there, we were just interviewing whoever it would have been, you know. Tom Dolby, Marillion, you know. Meat, meatloaf. Uh, meatloaf, you know, and you couldn't go back to the archive. I know, now, of course, you know, all that stuff's really valuable, but it was all about the present, you know, I know. so... Uh, Top, top, top of the pops obviously got round it because you had to re-record. You had to record the thing so the BBC owned the rights, which is why BBC Four now is just full of you know old top of the pops and getting yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. But of course, you 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 wouldn't have the resources to do that. That's that's miserable. You had some of the best people on. I mean, the best people. It must, but it still exists. You just can't show it. Is that right? Uh, well, I don't know whether well, it's all on YouTube. I mean, I, I, you must get this, be real. Because I, I get emails from people saying, I was looking at, I was looking at an old clip of you interviewing so-and-so last night. Mm -hmm. And I re re replied to them saying, I never met so -so. No memory. Oh, yeah, yeah. No memory that was. And, God, and, and they go, go on. Oh, that's so excited. I wish my husband could hear this. So it's like, this happens to me all the time. In fact, to the extent that I was driving one day, um, and, then, and, then, and a radio interview or a documentary came on about Dex's Midnight Runners. I thought, oh, well, I like Dex's Midnight Runners. This is really interesting, really enjoying them until they got to the end. <laughs> they hear your own voice. <laughs> yeah, who's that woman? Yeah. No, worse, worse. They went, right, can we move on to the interview? And they went, yeah, I went, oh, that's very interesting. The Muriel Gray interview. I went, I've never met these people. And apparently it ruined their lives. And I go, I have no recollection of Oh, really? Or even ruining their lives. And a, <laughs> a similar case with poor old Banana Rama. I mean, so there's a whole bunch of people out there who loathe me who I don't even recall meeting. So um, th this is quite bad. So you have just made me so happy, Steve. But, um, I've got I've actually. It's, it's David, by the way. Dave. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right, clearly made a big impression on you. Don't worry. Don't worry. You're real. <laughs> don't worry, Meryl. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, you're not alone in this. I think, I think if you do, if you interview pop groups on television programs, that kind of thing will happen all the time. Especially can't remember who you're speaking to. I'm not actually in bed. I'm actually in a home for the wandering. Yeah, the, the bewildered. <laughs> the bewildered. <laughs> Twilight home. <laughs> Don't worry. The guy I want to know about the punk band. You were in a punk band called, called uh, Family Von Trapp. Yeah. Uh, I, I, do you have, did they make any records? Yeah, well, I've got my guitar from it here if you'd like to see it. Oh, yeah, yeah, come come on. On. go on. We want to see it. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Look at that. Oh, are you in a guitar? Were you the singer too? But, well, not really. A bit, but um, it's a, isn't that lovely? It it is. Is lovely. Gorgeous. Oh, wow. 12 yeah. string. Yeah. Well, String Baldwin, and it's just actually been uh, recently re refurbed, so it's very, very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, we had, no, we had a very lovely singer, and um, no, we were absolutely terrible. But um, I did have another story about forgetting things, by the way. Go just on. Before we talk about that, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Megan. Let's have it. Yeah. <laughs> so I, was, I was in a restaurant with them. Um, I used to do... a. Uh, uh, a kind of closed program with a lovely woman called Marie Helvin who's married to David Bailey and right, she's a right, big, right. big mate yeah. of mine. 
uh, <laughs> we're in this very posh restaurant and, and uh, Pete Townsend came in. I don't know if this story still works, given given what happened to Pete Townsend. But um, he came up and spoke to Marie because she, she was a big friend. And then he said, oh, hello, how lovely to meet you again. To me, you know, I mean, well, uh, it's amazing to meet you too, but unfortunately, you know, we've never met. You're obviously confusing me with somebody else. He said, no, 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 we, ha we have met, we have. And, and, and I kept going, no, no, we haven't. And then eventually I did the worst thing. I said, do you seriously think that I would have forgotten forgotten meeting the absolute seminal guitarist from The Who. Would I forget that? And he went, you interviewed me on the tube. And I went, oh, yeah, so I did, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in your defence, don't you think that the white heat of live television drives those memories out of your head? Because that's yes. what happened with me and Dave. You know, We interviewed loads of people, and, and, and I think it's just you're so preoccupied with being on TV with the number of people watching, with the number of technical things you've got to remember, yeah. that actually the person you're talking to and often the, the nature of the conversation is one of your least priorities, which yeah. is ridiculous, yeah. really. It's, it's absolutely terrible. I remember there was a... There was a, a, a do you remember uh, Morton Harkett from... Um, yeah, from the heart. And then, um, you know, my job was to obviously be the cynical public, anything about pop, and, and but he, did, he hadn't turned up until just 10 seconds about before we we're about to go. And then, um, I, uh, so I was slightly irritated already, so I had all my questions ready to kind of you know, be horrible to him. And then he turned up and I went, oh! and it was like looking into the face of God. I'd never seen a more handsome man and he was so charming. So he sat down and I couldn't think of anything to ask him. So we ran out of words in about 30 seconds. And then I went, I see you climb trees. <laughs> and he went, what, on tour? I went, no, just in general. And they went, right, cut to Paula. <laughs> <laughs> what made you ask that? Because it was in the research. There was no oh, one no. Oh, oh, God. Oh, that's so ridiculous. <laughs> ask him about the tree climbing, exclamation mark. You yeah. see, my, my theory, having interviewed millions of pop stars, I'll see if you believe, I'll see if you agree that with this, Muriel. Yeah. In the end, you don't really want to ask them any questions at all. You just want ah. to look at them. You want well. to expect them. Am I right? You're more than right, Dave, because actually um, I had a meeting once at the production uh, meeting at the Tube and I said, can I just ask why we're asking these people to articulate themselves verbally when the, clearly the way they articulate themselves is through music? We weren't expecting them all to be like James Robertson Justice. Absolutely. That's He's so true. I mean, most of them are idiots. This is not how they express themselves. No, it's like, you know, I mean, the most articulate, amazing musicians sound like fools when you speak to them. And that's not fair because clearly they're not. But um, so I said, we really are wasting our time here. But that, that really didn't go down very well. So I agree <laughs> with you, David. We just wanted to, you know, sort of look at them and touch them and stuff. And I just wanted to hear them hear them sing or play but, well um, yeah but i think you also want to watch them behave you want to yeah. watch them with each other how they move how they come in a room how they go out of it all that kind of stuff the I people find who are with them fascinating they're always the most <laughs> fascinating thing i used to find in interviews is when the telephone went and they had to pick up the telephone had a very brief conversation with somebody and and you found out so much about their their mannerisms yeah. and the way yeah. they operated and who that person was and just in that snapshot you got an incredible amount of information because they yeah, weren't I, kind of on show, you know. Yeah, we were. I mean, we were miles before Big Brother, but the ideal thing would have been just to go on a house party with them, you know, a weekend in a in a country house. Would have told you much more than tell me about your new album. But I can see the difficulties with that. No, <laughs> yes, there might be some. Yeah, tell me about your new album. Makes your heart sink. Oh, yeah. oh, oh. I mean, I had to interview Scott Walker, the darling man, and he wouldn't speak at all. And so, you know, I, I broadcasters, as we three are, used to end up filling the silence with, you know, moronic things. And it's, it's just awful. And I thought, why are we doing this to you? What, what, you know, what crime have you ever committed that we're putting? <laughs> well, to, to be fair, they've hired promotion people whose job it is to get them on the tube. I know, the I whistle know. Test, to, to be interviewed. And then. they've agreed to do it. <laughs> so, agreed you know. to do it. If they didn't oh, want on. to do it, don't oh, do it. But the, the, there's a species of pop star, and Scott Walker was a very good example of this, actually, of people who, who yeah, need the publicity, but then get all their, uh, get all the publicity out of pretending they don't want the publicity. It's a kind of Lou Reed thing. Lou Reed was constantly promoted by PRs for interviews. And when he got there, it was a great block of ice that, uh, yeah. that intimidated well, and terrified well, him. 
the meanest one to me ever, actually, was a uh, yeah, which is strange. He's actually looking at me now. I actually look like him today um, on a bad day. Um, the very first time I was ever on TV, and the first interview I had to do was with Paul Weller. You know, yeah. you know, a great big deal about you know, or you know, you know, it's great to have young people on. I mean, and he just he just <laughs> deliberately, deliberately just wouldn't answer any of my questions, and you know, could oh. tell how nervous I was. And then afterwards. He sent me a note from you know via his PR person and it said, I'm sorry for what I done. Uh, and, and instead of keeping it, I scored it out and said, Did Mr. Weller? Why didn't I just keep the note? Uh, you should. But I, I, I you could be holding it up now. It'd be immortalized. I, I exactly. know I know how you feel because you must have done interviews. Have you ever done ro- interviews with rock stars in front of an audience, in front of a you know, a live event or whatever? Where yes. they're, sli- they're slightly intimidated themselves. Yes. yes. And so the way they deal with it is not saying much. And so you're the one that looks like a fool. Yeah, you're you're putting them <laughs> under pressure and they're getting all the sympathy from the audience. They're thinking, yes. leave him alone. <laughs> My God, you know, what what did what did uh, you know what did Steve Harley ever do to you? You know. <laughs> oh, I don't know, there's probably a radio documentary telling you what you did to him somewhere and that'll make you Yeah, that's right. It is. It'll pop yeah. up eventually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh god obviously I mean, we can not i mean none of the three of us could ever write our memoirs in because we've clearly become wandered haven't we i, I don't know I, I think there's a limited a limited market for my memoirs certainly I, 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 they wouldn't the same wouldn't apply with you muriel i'm sure so can, what, go on no 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 you go on you what, what are you doing for christmas <laughs> what kind of shit questions are these yes. <laughs> Well, I Sorry. think that's a legitimate I know, question. Uh, perfectly. Uh, it's a question yeah. I ask anybody. What are you doing for Christmas? Yeah. What am I doing for Christmas? <laughs> well, be, well, well uh, my husband and I and uh, my sister, uh, who are in a bubble, and my daughter will be in one room and our sons will be in another room, not allowed, and with a toilet of their own to use because we're not al- allowed to be together. Oh, is the God is well, that? Is that, is that that's, abs- that's, that's, the, that's the rule up there? Seriously? Yeah. Because we can have three different families in one household. So you can't have that. Oh, no. dear. Oh, dear. No, and, also that, I mean, and, and the boys are young and around and everywhere. So they're probably beating with every kind of, you know, virus that has ever been invented. So I'm afraid we have to, you know, apparently somebody had the idea of you can throw a rug over them and hug them. But um, I'm, I'm not so sure that that would work. But anyway, we can't be in the same room. So I'm going to I'm going to poke Christmas dinner with a large stick at them. Uh, right. my, my wife did that with our eldest son the other day during, during the lockdowns. They both turned up. They were both wearing big coats. They both took their coats off, put them oh. on back to front. Oh. And then hugged each other. <laughs> These giant pug. Then hugged each other and put the coats back on again the right way. I thought oh. it was quite sweet. It took ages. But it's worth you- it. Christmas then, the pair of you. Sorry? Christmas. What? Yeah, what uh, are you doing? Well, no, I'm just here. I've, I've yeah, got family, well, you know, kids and grandkids or whatever. Grandkids don't count, apparently. You've got uh, kids. How did you get grandkids? You started early. No, not wildly. Well, at he's all. in his early 50s. He's looking <laughs> oh, good at it. Steady. Yeah. <laughs> steady, steady, steady. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, uh, you know, it, it'll, be, it'll be quiet, as quiet as it can be, possibly, involving grandkids. But uh, look, I'm looking forward to it. Anyway. <laughs> So do they respect you and ask you things about music? And they're stuff? only oh, I know. They're no, not old enough for that. Listen, they, oh. they're not they're only three. But uh, but I but even my own children who are now kind of obviously adults, they've never asked me about music at all, and I've never encouraged them to ask me about music at all. I actually loathe the whole idea of trying to trying to make your children hip. You know what I mean? Oh right. yeah, well, you'll. Always... Wouldn't it be awful if you had grandchildren saying, "Should I be listening to early magazine albums?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? or, or should it just be Pete Shelley's solo stuff, late period? I mean, that would just be <laughs> awful, wouldn't it? God, that's dreadful. <laughs> you know, uh... I've got a friend who wants to. It was so keen on educating his children's edu- education that he he took one of his kids to see the Rolling Stones at Wembley Stadium. 
oh. much against this boy's will. He went yeah. along, and when the Stones came, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the greatest rock and roll band in the world, the Rolling Stones. He very, very obviously took out a pair of headphones, clamped them on, <laughs> and listened to, I think it was Aphex Twig or something <laughs> through it. And my friend Dave was telling me how pissed off he was. And I, I had no sympathy for him no, whatsoever. No. I said, <laughs> what do you fucking expect? I oh, for God's sake, that's, you can't <laughs> tell people to like a certain type of music. It's going to make them run a mile. You know? Absolutely. They're all pensioners, for God's sake. You know, uh, gentlemen, here's some old men. You know, please. Know. <laughs> some pop music. Yeah, I said that out loud. Tonight. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I just said <laughs> Terrible. So have you got any more artefacts there? Any more old records and odds and ends? Yes, what else have I got here? Let me have a look. Um, yes, I, this is, this is a, an amusing thing. Is when I was young, I mean, I mean talking prepubescent, the person that I was most in love with, and uh, you're not allowed to laugh, was Elton John. Uh, I just said, no, it's fun. We didn't laugh at all. I and saw I was, Elton John when I was 16, I think, or 15 or something, at the oh, Guildford oh. Civic Hall. He did some well, handstands on the keyboard. It was great. Yeah. Well, I was even earlier adopter because I, you know, I, I bought 171170. You know, the, oh the, the, my goodness, the life. Yeah, I have, and I can't find. But um, the thing that I thought was terribly funny was I found this gig. To talk amongst yourselves, gentlemen, for a All second. Right, go. That's fine. So 171170 uh, that came out, I think, in 1971. I think Elton John put out four records in 1971. Yeah, well, I, I bought that one and because I, I was in love with him because there was a, you know, there was a thing in Jackie, a spread of them, and, uh, and I just thought that's the most beautiful man I've ever seen. And, um, you know, ooh, how one gets things wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this, this is what I wanted to show you. Was just like, you know, I, I kept that loyalty up for some considerable time, thinking, well, you know, he's, you know, he's maybe losing his hair a little bit, but can you imagine anybody would want to actually oh, have... Oh, Rock of the that? Westies. Oh, Caribou. What's he called? Is that Carib Caribou? Caribou. Yeah. I mean, what, I mean, look at him. I mean... Because, Did I mean, you have that pinned on a bedroom wall or something? I no, mean, I because, you see, I like the Tumbleweed Connection, Elton John. Yes, I do too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, just all that Bernie Taupe and stuff. And again... You know the days of the album? Look at this beautiful thing, right? So there's the album, Tumbleweed yes, Kids. Yes, and yeah. Inside, inside you get you get this. And you get all these beautiful things. You get the songs. Yeah. You know, and a lovely kind of beautiful paper. There's all the lyrics. There's all the people. And, everything. and, then, and that, I mean, frankly, if there wasn't even a record in there, that would have been good value. So you so, know the you know the cover of that of that record, which yeah. is sp supposed to look like a kind of frontier railroad station yeah. in the old yeah. west. And look how handsome he looks there. Look handsome. Do you know he where does. that do you know where that picture was taken? Oh no, please tell me. It was taken on the Blue Bell Railway in Sussex. You're kidding me. It's the <laughs> least western possible location. The David, I've talked about this quite a lot, this record, because the whole thing is based about the romance of being in America. And at that stage, neither of them had ever been to America. I don't know. Neither, neither Elton or Bernie, who were only about 22 or something at the time, had never been to the States. So it was all it's, complete fancy. So did they, they put up, they presumably art directed all these things. And well, stuff I, think, I think they're English signs. I think mainly they're... they're oh, you're right, it's tea. Uh, it. yeah. yeah, it's yeah. Not, you know something? I'd never. In fact, the Sunday Times. If anybody, if I had had a little bit of, you know, Inspector Morse, I'd have realised. Look, the Daily Telegraph. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah not Daily quite Telegraph. so American. It's just. It, if, if, I've noticed that. Thank you. That's changed my life. Thank if you, you. If you if you do it in sepia, everybody thinks it's American. Yeah. Really. Yeah. yeah. But I love. Again, that that is. I mean, I'm sure you must discuss this with every guest you have on the actual physicality of the album. Oh, I mean, that's. In fact, it's it's album covers that made me want to go to art school and be a graphic designer in the first. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Because I wanted to be a. You know, who didn't want to be Roger Dean for God's sake? You know, unbelievable. Oh, I love so, how you picked Roger Dean. That's great. <laughs> yeah. oh, no, no, no. He was so fashionable at the time. The Aussie Beza cover. Of the great yeah. flying elephant. I mean, they were wonderful, yeah, really. But they were kind of quite limited in their uh, scope, weren't they? They're yeah, very yeah. similar. And Cameron, you know, James Cameron had to pay him a lot of money for stealing those floating islands, didn't he? For, you know, kind of Avatar. Um, no, OK, I am going to actually say, look, he was handsome then, look. You yes, know. he was. No, no, we, we, we accept your... Um, you accept you, that. Yeah. yeah, we do. It's for your forgiven. What would happen? <laughs> 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 Who knew... 
for you. I'm still mighty fond of him, but then again, that was not complicated by me ever being wildly in love with him and pinning posters well, of him. Up on, up I on did wall. blow it actually spectacularly because we did it at one point in the eighties. We had some mutual friends, and I thought, oh, sure, something maybe maybe I actually end up being friends with Elton John after having done it. But we were sitting in makeup next to each other because he was on the tube, and I thought, can you imagine sitting next to someone who you'd actually had fantasies about marrying and having their children and everything, and then. Um, but by this time, he'd slightly tipped over into to Vegas, Vegas Elton. And I just said the worst thing you could ever say to a narcissistic middle-aged gay man, which was, I used to love you when I was a wee girl. <laughs> 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 well, that was really clever. <laughs> Ruined his year. I'm sure he can it. cope with it. I'm sure he's. I'm sure he's uh, all, all man of these things he's dealt with before. Yeah, there's, but... there's nothing you can say to Elton John, really, is there? You ca- there's no casual conversation opener, is there, really, with Elton? Well, do you know what? Over the years, actually, Dave, I have found that you can make ca- casual conversation with people if you just don't talk about their subject. For instance, yeah. you know. Uh, you know, Mark and I could have a conversation about diving, and that would be very interesting. All right, okay. Yeah. yeah you, you're a diver, aren't you? Mm, yes, yeah. Like, yeah, occasionally, badly. But the thing is, so don't talk about the thing that they're famous for, and then you can actually, you end up having the best conversations ever. Because if you talk about the thing that they're always known for, and this goes with film stars too, particularly, they're just actors, you know. Yeah. They're ready to stand somewhere, and somebody cleverer than them writes really good things for them to say and yes. um, so you know, so why would you want to, they don't want to talk about the film they didn't make it up no, <laughs> no. So probably, you, they haven't seen it probably. they haven't seen it they're not interested in it and so and um, because i remember being introduced to um also they uh, made it two years ago and they've forgotten they've been they've done two other yeah. films since then so you know so absolutely totally i remember um catherine susan jones at some party thing introduced me to um uh, who's she married to again again this is the by michael, michael douglas, douglas. Yes, thank you, Michael Douglas. And then, Barry, uh, Barry Douglas, yeah. Yeah, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that boy, that boy. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, and uh, and he was he was bored of his tits at this particular you know party because everyone was just going your way. I love your stuff, but I just happened to know that they had a house in New York. And I went, have you still got that house in New York? And he went, yeah. I mean, does it leak? And then and then we were off. And that, so that was fun. We talked about roof gutterings and, you know, how you couldn't get people to fix a dry stone wall. And that's how you do it. He doesn't really want to talk about falling down or, you know, basically, no. he's not interested. So I think that's the secret. And if only I had known that, you know, if I'd known that on the tube, I think I probably would have been an award winning interviewer because I should have just, I should have actually gone down that you climb trees route much more often. Well, that was, it was almost a smash hits technique, wasn't it? Smash mm-hmm. hits did that brilliantly. Smash hits would ask people, you know, does your mother play golf and what colour is Tuesday and yeah, all that kind brilliant. of stuff. And actually they got the most wonderful responses because immediately these people were kind of, they were just off guard. You know, they were just kind of, well, there was no wrong answer. Oh. You could just be funny and flip. You weren't being judged at all, really, you know. No, Have you ever been sick in a gumboot was a great question. That was great, you know. Marshes was very, very funny. Was that all you, or did you have lots of comedy writers? Oh, no, no, oh, not all us, but we, ha- we were there in the early days. I think it probably got f- funnier even after, we, after we'd gone yeah, there. It the got a lot funnier mid-80s. when I left, yeah. It, yeah no, no. <laughs> I like to feel it was my major contribution, my leaving, well, and then making, making it funny. <laughs> Uh, but he never had comedy writers. He, he had loads of people who thought they were comedy Just writers. Just thought they were really funny. People who wrote headlines for a kind of a, for a wet, wet, wet feature. The cover line for the wet, wet, wet feature in 1985, I think, was Okai Jock Mackay, look at the state of the wets. I mean, that's not... <laughs> Actually, now, of course, that'd be called racist, I think. <laughs> but, but we never wrote anything quite as uh, outrageous as that. Uh, Corky O'Reilly, it's Kylie. I you know, like do that again. I ache for people to be able to do that again without actually being torn to shreds. I know, I know. Now, now it would be some kind of terrible cultural collision, wouldn't it? You know. Well, there's what? like going back to your Elton yeah. John record, it struck me I was writing something about it recently, and that would now be called cultural appropriation. It yes. would. You know, it would. In fact, it would never in fact even about. worse. Even worse, Madman Across the Water. <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. because of course, this is lots about sort of North American culture, and uh, and they would have got into some very, very bad, 
very, very bad trouble over this. So, yeah, but I mean, honestly, culture appropriation, they're ridiculous. That means that you're only allowed to write about what you are. So I'm just allowed to write about turnips or something. That would be awful. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so all, all of pop music may as well be just, you know, discarded, really, because most yeah. of it is people pretending to be things that they're not. You know? Completely. I mean, I mean, particularly, I mean, the American influence, you know, particularly on Scottish music was huge. And, and that, and obviously when all this kind of, you know, you know, let's break up in, into tribes has started and you're not allowed to, you know, uh, anyway, like, like, let's, let's leave that be. But oh, in fact, I've got a really good example of that. Oh, I just happen to have here. Oh, I mean, on. do you think J.C. Ray would get oh! away with <laughs> That's great. Oh, God, remind me about J.C. Ray. Uh, Go on. Jesse Ray was um was was a musician stroke director and a very good video director actually and he did this one called Over the Sea, which was uh, he used to do things like can you see that with him like standing on a standing was he like Scottish? A... It was his what? Was he Scottish? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. No, I know, I know. I just thought it might be an appropriation it might be thing. Uh, well, Elton John was not American. I thought he might have come from Tunbridge Wells and was just kind of <laughs> grab a bit of Scottish culture. No, no, clearly he looks Scottish. Go on. No, no, the only point was... <laughs> Um, he wouldn't. He, he said at the time, which we all thought was terribly amusing, uh, that he would never take his helmet off and reveal his identity until Scotland was free. Oh, um, oh but, right, right. I, I, I believe he still ha uh, hasn't got it on now because he's probably about seventy. But um, again, I really, really fancied Jesse Ray because I mean he was stacked. Um, I mean, as you can see there, I'd like it. Look, I mean, look at that man's. I mean, he didn't, I didn't know what he looked like. But he had smashing arms. But um, he, he directed this uh, video <laughs> over the sea where he was standing on top of the Brooklyn Bridge and cutting between the skyscrapers of New York and the Highlands of Scotland on top of, you know, Glencoe. And uh, the director who did Highlander completely stole, the, you know, frame for frame that, that thing. So Jesse, I think, took him to court. I think he won. Actually, because it was a complete steal. Small piece of trivia. Very good, very good. Hey, <laughs> I love the way that you fancy this man, you can barely see him because he's got a massive, great steel helmet on, you know. Yeah, well, it's a bit, well, I just liked him from the neck down. I, I just a yeah. bit bad news for you, boys. No, sometimes. I just thought it was amusing that he might not be Scottish, it was just simply <laughs> trying to so, grab so, a bit of the action. <laughs> so you, sp you, spend, you spend quite a bit of time in the great outdoors, am I right? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm loving your, I'm loving your darling little kind of Wikipedia prepared questions. No, you... <laughs> not at all. It's oh, really good. You wrote no, a book about the Munros. I, I didn't even you? know that. I didn't even know that. It's just I follow Muriel on on Twitter. Yeah. I see, I see interesting pictures of the great right. outdoors. Well, I see interesting pictures of newts or whatever. I think yeah, oh, that's interesting. No, you don't think that's interesting at all. I it's do. It is. Oh yeah, it is hugely. I'm very interested. That's that's terrifying. Actually, one of the most terrifying thing was, you know, I do again forget that you know people read that stuff and um, uh, my obsession with newts. It was Philip Pullman that wrote his Dark Materials. Will not let me stop doing that. I was going, Philip Pullman. What you? Know, what does V.S. Naipaul think of you know my sourdoughs? I mean, it's so surreal. Twitter. You don't know who's looking at you. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I was interested. So, but you're presumably not, your access to the great outdoors is limited at the moment, presumably. Yes, this is a very large bone of contention because, I mean, the illogicality of that is just ludicrous. You know, so I can't, I can, I can leave my house now and go to B&Q or Morrison's and, you know, bump up against, you know, hundreds of people, but I'm not allowed to get in the car and drive up to a mountain where there's nobody walk to the top and drive back really? again. Yeah, talk me through that one. It's um, I understand. I understand the the idea. It's all or nothing. But it's uh, yeah, being kept out of the countryside for me is a bit of a pain. But it was even when I did the tube. I have to say, everyone else always imagined. You probably both got this as well. People probably had this idea that the peer review, the moment that you, you sort of left the studio, you're out clubbing. And um, I used to just get on the train straight back up to Scotland and then and then mountain here for the next two days. Um, even in my 20s, people have a very strange idea of what you are if you present a music programme. Yeah. I don't think anybody ever thought Mark and I went clubbing. 
Dave and I once did an interview together for a, a, a best of uh, old Chris and uh, old Greg Wilson. I've got to set, I've got to we... set this up, Muriel. First of yeah. all, right. all, all the former Whistle Test presenters were all interviewed for a retrospective DVD, whatever. And so they had Bob and they had Annie and I, I don't know who. And they were all interviewed individually. But Mark and I was, were doing it. Thought we would better do, do it. We're old pals. We thought let's do it together. together. So we did it, it in my home. Fun. We did it downstairs here, sitting on the sofa. There was a crackling log fire. And at one point, a cat kind of walked across the back of the sofa. And I think we sat in on our, one of our laps, you know. And I think from that moment on, a kind of Eric and Ernie, <laughs> same bed kind of, are they, aren't they? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> and I just very funny, we went to a festival last year <laughs> in uh, Port, uh, Port Elliot in, uh, in Cornwall. And we were staying in a lovely little cabin up on the, uh, belonging to a mate of up on the cliffs, a shabba, a chalet. And uh, there were some people who walked by. <laughs> David, I was sitting out there the that cup. morning having, having a pan of chocolate or a croissant or something like that, and a cup of coffee, you know, a chunky you cup. And, yeah. you know, and yeah, some people went by and we saw them look at us and then look back later on, you know, and we just thought, they must be thinking, it's true. It's true. <laughs> Those two guys. The whistle test, they've, they been living, they've been living together since 1982. Yeah, all this stuff about and wives. Then, all this stuff about wives and children. Oh, forget that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna know pitch a fly fishing show with the pair of you because that. Yeah, there you yeah, go. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. That was funny. That'd God. be a, that would be a winner. <laughs> so go on. Any more records? Any more things? Yes, I've got more things. Let me have a look. There's. Uh, have a look. Let's have a look. Yeah, got some quite interesting things here. Uh, they're all in my bed, so this is really badly prepared, obviously. I need to. Oh, I need to show you that first of all, which was my Iggy Pop action figure. Oh, oh that's good. good. Oh, I like that. Yeah, exactly. You want that, don't you? You know, you, you want really that. do. Yeah, good, 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 must, good definition. Who yes. described Iggy Pop as looking like a condom full of walnuts? <laughs> that, was, that was Schwarzenegger. Schwarzenegger. Oh, was he Schwarzenegger? Okay. Yeah. That's true. I love Iggy Pop, and again, that is an interview that I do remember because he talked about my pantyhose, and I didn't know what he was talking about. Pantyhose. He meant tights, but yeah. it stayed. Um, yes, I was going to show you some some Scottish things now, just because we're being Scottish. Uh, <laughs> because uh, the, of course, there are all kinds of wonderful things. Do you remember the painted word? Do you remember the painted word? No, you don't remember. Not at all. No, not remotely. How funny. Not remotely. Okay, that's right. And of course, the associates. I just had to get that in because of love. Uh, yeah. Because he, uh, I were mates with a lovely man. Um, called, um, uh, hang on, I'll get anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, um, he was very naughty, Billy McKenzie, and in the days, yes, um, Joseph K, you remember Paul Haig? Yes. All right, yeah, right, yeah. right, yes. But Billy, Billy and Paul were best friends, um, and uh, I rather stupidly got into their into their company, and that's the days before mobile, mobile phones, anyway, they would get very drunk, and then they would go to a... Uh, at phone box and call me up at four o'clock in the morning, just all the time, just for the just for the heck of it and everything. And so I mean, I, and I couldn't stand it, but um, they're adorable and they made some very strange. So they would go out to a telephone box. This yeah. is this is amusement back in the day. Yeah. That's all you can do. You can, <laughs> but you've got to really want to do that because you you really you have nowadays got to you think, well, four in the morning, let's ring Muriel Gray and annoy her, just get out the mobile. But to have to get a coat on and yeah, walk out and find a phone box that actually worked and was one of you that had been vandalised. <laughs> it's always a real effort, isn't it? I, I hope it was worth it. <laughs> um, here's the thing I found, because that's not going anywhere. Um, uh, it's just like, I found this thing from Billy Bragg and it says to to Mew with love from Billy Bragg because he did we did oh, go back very to nice. his hotel once but and that's like but it does say 399 or less on that's it that's right and I quite like that that's good yeah and that's quite good um what else have I got here obviously I've got that because that that's um, the, that oh, led God. life that led my life so oh, really oh god yes I was such a, 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 you know, heavy metal person and kind of, well, they're not really heavy metal. They were like hippies, really. But, um, deep purple and rock. I just wanted, I just wanted to show you that because, right. again, imagine preferring Elton John to that. <laughs> <laughs> what was I thinking? What was I thinking? Well, you were younger. You were impressionable. 
Fair John. enough. And he was great looking, Elton John. He was. He was. He was beautiful. He was absolutely yeah. beautiful. Uh, yes, there you are. I don't think he popped one. Got that signed to me. Right. Oh, nice. Very, very good. good. Oh, very good. Uh, I'm fumbling about now because something I did want to show you as well. Uh, yes, this is the most disturbing thing ever, actually, is that when I was at my best, you know, all young people are pretty at some point, and um, I looked like Boy George. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that's not fair, is that if you're the prettiest, you look like a boy, but that could be me. Look. Well, he wasn't the most boyish boy, was he? Let's be honest. No, he's very, yeah, he's very pretty, but it still bothers me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, obviously, you know, that band that I loved yeah. more than anything else in the entire You're world. You're contractually but, obliged as a Scots person to, uh, you know, No, well, Simple Minds took me with them to Live Aid in Philadelphia. Oh, oh brilliant. Really? Wow, that must have been amazing. Jeff, oh, no, of course, Glasgow. Yeah, there's, there's a connection there, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, the advice that Bruce Finlay, who you might not know, he was... Uh, I know, yeah. We know Bruce. Oh, well, he was, he was not only their manager, Lovely but he was... Lovely guy run these fantastic uh, record shops in Edinburgh called Bruce's. Bruce's Records, yeah. And so for a while I was in the tube, some of mine came in the tube and I could, I mean, that was a band I could not even speak to because I'd worship them so much, but then it turned out they were hilarious and fantastic and we got and became friends. And then Bruce um, did a few contracts for me for a while and everything and then just Live Aid came up and they invited me to, to go with them. I mean, it was a ridiculous thing. I was on stage with them. Because everybody at that time had um, cause, uh, uh, lanyards with a, a, an alphabet number on it. And as, until you're thinking, you could walk across the stage. If, so if you were Z, you could walk across the stage till the end. It was great. But um, yeah, so I love them very much. And they're all, they're fine. So what was your major memory of being at Live Aid in Philadelphia? In Philadelphia? Yeah, where were you? For, did you do it in London? We were in, in Wem Wem Wembley, but Philadelphia had all the action. You had Bob Dylan and Ronnie Wood and Keith Richards uh, enjoying the hospitality for an eight-hour drinking session before their yeah. memorable performance. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> it, was, it was absolutely incredible. But again, I was going to bring on Ronnie Wood and Keith Richards, but I don't know where they are, was his opening <laughs> line. Which is a great line. <laughs> after there was some bizarre things, like even after the event, I mean, we'll go back to the event in a minute, but after the event, there was, you know, everyone was wondering where the party was. We, we, where's the party? And there was this ghastly big sort of Hilton or something, you know, horrible big faceless hotel. And everyone went, it's there, it's there, it's there. So um, somebody I was with took me there. And indeed, there were lots of guards around the door and everything. And, um, and for some reason, I think it's because I still had my lanyard on, I just got waved through. And the Thompson twins were behind me and they were keeping them out. So I was going, no, no, they've just been on stage. I'm nobody. I'm just a licker. I'm the, I'm the fraud. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had to talk the Thompson twins into this party, which turned out to be in a... I mean, awful. This this little kind of room, you know, which was a suite, obviously, but I mean, no bigger than you know, kind of like quite a small American suite. But in it was Bob Dylan, Keith Richards, uh, other big famous people, and, and I thought just exactly what you said earlier, Dave. I, I, what? Why? Why would I want to be here? I don't know these people, and I haven't got anything to say to them. And they're not interested in meeting you. This is. It's just like being in the same room. It's not that interesting. So I left very quickly. Oh, well, I, I would have hung around just I would have hung them. around for Just ever. to look at them. Just to observe <laughs> them. <laughs> no, I mean, I I'd rather admire your, uh, your, your, uh, your, your standards there, but I would have been perfectly happily just being a fly on the wall just to be able well, to observe Bob Dylan in action. It'd be wonderful. He, but, well, well, I did observe him, and it was just like w watching some, you know, really ordinary people talking to each other. I mean, there was nothing that made me want to go, whoa, nothing at all. I mean, there was no, there was no peals of laughter. There was no, you know, mad behaviour or anything. It was just like, it was like the kind of, a sort of like a bowling club. Yeah, they did. Yeah, that's the great truth is that they do discuss the most boring subjects. Yeah, because you expect them to sort of, Bob Dylan to suddenly kind of go, the black owl of night comes flying <laughs> to the wardrobe of my soul. And you think, you know, and actually he says, it, 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 got any sugar? Just come the sugars in this and be brilliant. They're kind of normal, you know. You expect to be on the whole time and poetic but, and performing. Yeah, even, I've got, and even worse, actually, this is like, this is like a confession booth, actually, because this is my awful David Bowie story. I'm so ashamed of this. But it's just part of his 
well. I know, it's awful. Again, again, it goes back to Marie. Um, uh, you know, the, the, just my friends that I was kicking about, they, were, they happened to be supermodels. Because <laughs> I was the, I was their ugly friend. They used to take around as like a kind of court jester. Anyway, we're having dinner in this, uh, do you remember Langham's Bistro? Uh, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so I was there with these two r- really lovely women and then turned up uninvited it was David Bowie um, with this, I think it must have been his publicist, she's a big gorgeous woman um, and, I, and I tutted you know because you know, <laughs> they weren't invited and I was There like, goes the neighbourhood yeah. Well anyway, so he sat down and at that time you could smoke and he and unfortunately he was a chain smoker which of course you know unfortunately probably led to his early demise which is tragic but um so he smoked constantly and i just went all the time <laughs> you know it's like because it was spoiling my meal and but here's the thing and i know this for a fact because he was in the company of uh, a model and two other models he had his i'm speaking to models head on because actually Around dinner, because we were we were there for quite a while, I would have had lots of things to have spoken to him about Berlin and I mean, but he was. How can I explain this? Are you all right, darling? Do you know what I mean? Really, slightly patronising these beautiful women because that's what pop stars do. But the yeah. trouble is that once a pop star arrives, it completely changes the tenor of the whole event. You know, it so didn't. you've got you've got a simultaneously how exciting that David Bowie's here with that's ruined the evening because now well, the whole evening is about David Bowie. Very much so, but uh, and actually, and thinking back now, that might have been my irritation that up until that point I was the funniest one. So you're both. All <laughs> uh, right. So, uh, yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. You're the end of competition until David Bowie turns up. Yeah. Now, no one's listening to you or looking at you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this guy. Who's this yeah. guy? Also, I was actually genuinely irritated that he was smoking through my meal. So I'm. Uh, no, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it is, a- it is fair that. Yeah, well, it's like that Bob, Bob Dylan said this, didn't he? That I look into rooms in pubs. I look through yeah. windows into pubs and it looks wonderful. And I'd like to go in. But I know that as soon as I go in, it won't be wonderful anymore because oh. I'll have gone in. Because I'll be there. That's right. It'll just be all <laughs> about Bob Dylan. Lot, there's a lot of truth in that. I know. Because you, know? you, must have, you must have walked in. I've done this. I've done this uh, just uh, once with Mick Jagger. I once walked into a room with Mick Jagger, behind Mick Jagger, i.e. near him. <laughs> of course. I, I was with him, but anyway. And the point is, you get a slight intimation of what it's like to be Mick Jagger, which is as soon as you walk into a room, the room changes. You can see it change. People just everybody fall to in the room turns. Their whole manner changes. Looks. They start <laughs> laughing at impossibly unfunny things and thinking everything's shrieking yeah. with mirth and excitement. That 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 is true. I mean, you, you see, I I do have a couple of ludicrously uh, famous close friends who. Um, I would give anything for them not to be famous because for that very reason, because actually if we go out somewhere, anyway, it has to be prearranged. You think, oh. You know, yeah, you're we... probably going to have a private room and all that. Otherwise it's just going to be We so, do. We so... do. That's not as much fun as just, you know, no, going. No. There's a great uh, John Lennon uh, uh, autobiography came out, um, autobiography, sorry, <laughs> biography recently by Kenneth Womack. He talks, John Lennon talks about analysing how people react. And he said that, one of the things you get is is people pretending to be really pissed off that you're there and giving you a hard time and being resentful just because you're the famous person. Yeah. You get the people who are who are just the opposite, which are who are terribly needy and want to come up and talk and get your autograph. So well, every aspect of it is grim. People well, liking think, you is, is terrible. People not liking Bowie, you is terrible. Yes, but the Bowie thing wasn't about fame, really, uh, because, I mean, at that point, I was such an idiot. I just took for granted that you used to meet these massively famous pop stars every, every week, and I really... You know, besides these days that I wasn't really that interested in them. I mean, awful. I mean, yeah. really awful. Um, so th- that wasn't really about his fame. It was just about the fact that he he wasn't being himself. And I could tell he was, I didn't want to be one of the women he was patronising. Yeah. He wasn't patronising him. He was, he had his, you know, I'm talking to Mod. And I've seen it in other, this is terrible. I'll probably get sued for this. But I've seen it as another really famous actor who I've seen do that as well. He's a really intelligent, Cambridge-educated, massively clever man. But when he's in the company of really beautiful women, he just becomes so dull. You just want to punch him in the face. Something so awful. But anyway, that's, that's beside the point. Um, uh, and there was something else I was going to say there, but oh yeah, going into pubs with people. 
can't remember. You say something. <laughs> no, well, you've got to give us a, your, your greatest. We, we usually uh, have a, a, an element of these. Where the, where people nominate the greatest record ever made. Oh, that right. Unless you've got, have you got more stuff to show us? Uh, nothing that would. Nothing no, would give us, give us, give us your nomination for the greatest record ever made. Okay, I just got to find it first. Hang on. Okay. Well, at least yeah. you know what it is. Ah, oh, you've got it with you. Yeah, of course, of course, I've got it with me. No, no, but, well, we talk, talked to Tim Rice yesterday, and we had to just get imagine it, didn't we? Really? Yeah. Never what did he choose? Uh, it was Del Shannon, "Run Away." It was "Run Away" by Del Shannon. That's right. Yeah. Oh, that's so he was taking this seriously then. Okay. He described oh, no. that as a teenage revolution, an entire teenage revolution in one minute, 58 seconds. You see, it's oh, that was Summertime Blues, sorry. Oh, <laughs> that's right. Which is his other choice. It's a preposterous question. The of course it is. Of course it is. Because it changes every day. It changes every yeah. minute. Because everybody knows it's Nelly the Elephant, you know. So. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a given. That's a given. Yeah. You know, that the greatest record ever made it's it's only real this is oh. a, a single pressing uh by the one of the, the greatest djs and music producers in the country dennis salta there we are dennis right. salta it's only real can you see that yeah okay. it's only it's gonna see his name oh, Den right. dennis salta dennis salta greatest greatest record ever made ever if no. you say so, one of your sons is a DJ, isn't he? Oh, is he? Oh, oh get away. <laughs> is he? Is he? What's his name? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Hector's his name. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we <laughs> rumbled. <laughs> <Bastards. laughs> so that's the first two doing? first, two first, Mark. First word in the attic conducted in bed. Yeah, and first one to climax in the plugging of a of a blood relation. Her own, of a blood relation. Of of her own F and B. <laughs> in the hope that he'll make so much money that he go and live somewhere else. All yeah, that kind of, all that brilliant. Kind of oh look, it's great to talk to you. Anyway, thanks for doing it. Fantastic. What do you do for the rest of the day? Staying in bed, presumably. <laughs> Just turning over and going back to sleep. Over, having a cup of tea. I'm not staying in bed. I have a great deal of governance to do, and also one of my one of my tooth is broken, so I've got a dental appointment at oh, three. Dear. Very, right. very excited by that. I'm what very exciting day by ahead. Oh well, well nothing for... but the excitement of this because this yeah. has been brilliant. How lovely to see you. Very nice. Very to see nice you. Thanks to see for talking to us. Fantastic. All right. All, right. All the best. We, Happy Christmas. We, we, Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view.